Whatever was said here touched my heart. I saw how people were in fear and living in a situation where they can't even express themselves. Hallelujah. So my tarot is restored from abuse, from abuse and persecution. This story is my story. So you will forgive me if I become emotional at some, at some point, but this is my story. I will share just a little bit of my story because of the time. Brothers and sisters, we go through problems. We go through difficulties. At some point in our life, those difficulties start to define us, start to dictate who we are. Those limitations that people have been talking about you start to define yourself. You become shy. You don't want to do certain things because of your past experience. Hallelujah. You may be a member of the congregation. You may come to church regularly, attend all services, and even lead some of them. Hallelujah. But the injustice you experienced in the past, all the negative things you went through, Maybe the mistakes you have made, the abuse you endured in your past, at some point they take the center stage of your life and they direct your life. They direct everything you do. It becomes easy for you to listen to this little voice that keeps reminding you about your limitations Keep reminding you about your lacks. Keep reminding you where you are coming from. If you believe that voice, because the entire childhood you went through, you were told over and over, you are nothing, you will amount to nothing, you are just a failure, look at yourself, you are less than nothing. You will never graduate, you will never get married, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When it's time to move on with your life, when it's time to take some serious commitment, when it's time to write a test or apply to a job, even to commit to serious relationship uh, involvement with a person, there are little demons like Apostle was saying last week. That is called anxiety. It start manifesting. All of a sudden, you don't want to move forward anymore. Before you know, his grandfather, called fear, takes control of you. Hallelujah. At that point, you have lost the battle because the enemy has won. Hallelujah. Am I talking about myself only? Brothers and sisters, this is God's time. Give a full attention to the word of God. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, different situations will provoke different behaviors. Hallelujah. Some of us, because of the past experience, just a little challenge will provoke fear the same the way I just said. But for other people, it's a different de demon that will manifest. Instead of anxiety, instead of, um, um, I don't know, panic, all these things, the person becomes controlling, becomes, becomes angry, becomes combative. For just a tiny little challenge, the person is ready to start a World War III. Right there, it's a fight. You, you, you don't understand, brother. There is nothing I said. No, the person is ready to fight. Hallelujah. Because you are under control. There is something controlling you. There is a situation you want to just disappear. You, you, you don't want to face the situation. Or you become combative. You want to fight right away. Amen. Today I will go through my story very quickly. Because of time, and then we will see where God is bringing us. Amen. 
as you can tell, I was born in Africa. Amen. That's where beautiful, great people come from. Amen. That's the origin of everything. The origin of life. Amen. <laughs> I know you will be excited. Amen. All of us, we're coming from the same person. Hallelujah. So all of us, we're coming from Africa. <laughs> Amen. I was born in a country called DR Congo. It's a huge country, four times bigger than Alberta, right in the middle of Africa. Very rich country. Everything you can name, you will find it there. If today we have cell phones, it's coming, all the material they use come from there. If in the past, Americans were able to stop Japanese because of these uh, bombs, guess what? The material they used to make those bombs were coming from there. So, I'm coming from somewhere. My parents were now born in Congo. They were born in Rwanda, which is a tiny, poor country, neighbor's country to DR Congo. Hallelujah. They flee persecution. They flee all the troubles and the tribulations because in Rwanda, they had two tribes. And I was from the minority tribe. They were from the minority tribe. So the majority started killing the minority, and whoever could save their life, flee from the country and find refuge in any country around. So my parents came to Congo. Uh, actually, they are now married. They meet there. They uh, got married there. They had kids there. My grandparents are uh, buried in Congo. My great-grandmother is buried in Congo. So I am Congolese from uh, parents from Rwanda. So I have all kind of um, uh, a mist of um, culture. Amen. In all the countries, not only U.S., but all the, the different countries, when you are immigrants, you are refugee, they tolerate you. Amen. So they were tolerating us. I read a lot. I know the history of so many places. I can tell you that Congolese are the most beautiful people you have never met. Thank you. They, will, they gave us everything that we needed. I grew up as everyone else. Even though from time to time people will say, you should go back where you're coming from. I was born in Congo, never been to any other country, and did not know where to go. So I grew up with that as a permanent abusive language as I heard my entire life. But that did not stop me to study and become the person I am today. Hallelujah. During that time, Different governments that we had in Congo tried to deport people, to bring them back where they're coming from. And then my grandparents on my mom's side were deported. They took them, they brought them to Rwanda. They found a, um, a forest where people do not live, it's only animals. That's where they dropped them. No food, nothing. So they had to survive. Today, this place called Niamara is a city. They built a city in a forest in Niamara that was not meant for people to live in. Elephant, all the snakes and everything I'm scared about, respected them. Hallelujah. My grandmother and some of the family managed to come back again to Congo because they could not survive there themselves. Amen. 
20 years ago or some 24, 25 years ago in Rwanda, that tiny country, they, the majority, decided to kill and finish all the Tutsi minority in the country. So the, the parents that I had over there, most of them were killed. Most of them. Some survived. And we do have in our church here people who were there and who survived the killing. They are here today. Hallelujah. This was a very brutal moment. Finally, the minority managed to defend themselves because no one was defending them. They managed to defend themselves and to take the power and to stop the genocide that was happening. From that time to now, they are still in power. They have changed this very poor country to something very beautiful and very secure today. Hallelujah. Now the killers managed to leave the country and they pushed the population outside of the country and those people came to Congo and to other countries around. So my parents who flee Rwanda long time ago, one day they woke up in the morning and everywhere were those people who killed them when they were still living in Rwanda. They were right there because they got kicked out. Their plan to finish the minority did not work. <laughs> they found themselves out of the country. But my parents now were afraid. They did not know where to go because they fled that country for years and now the killers are right there. So they did only one thing they could do is to go back where they were coming from because now the people who were living there were Tutsis like them and it was peaceful now for them. I was living in Congo and all of this is just a story for me because Hutu, Tutsi, or whatever you want, I don't care. I don't understand and I don't care. White, blue, green, I really don't care. I care about are you a Christian or not? And if you are not, it's an opportunity to me to minister to you. That's all I care about. Hallelujah. Once you die, few weeks, if they buried a king here and they buried you here and buried an Asian here, you all look the same. That difference you had, it, it's the first thing that will go. The things that we do not see will remain there for years and years and years. Hallelujah. So now I was living in Congo. The killers are there. The killers associated themselves with the local government in Congo. And they, they continue to kill Tutsis who were living there. So myself who was living there for, I was born there, do not know the history, do not know anything about all these things. I found myself in danger. One day, they went from houses to houses to collect everything that looked like a Tutsi because the idea was to kill them. On TV, you can see on YouTube, they described how a Tutsi looked like. For sure, there is some physical differences. Most of the time, we are tall. I think I'm the exception. <laughs> no, there is some differences that I really don't care about. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I was not living in a village. I was living in, in a capital city. Congo is a huge country. Just the capital city at that time had more than 10 million people living in there. Amen. So they came in there. They went from houses to houses. It, be, it became dangerous where I was living. I, we moved in, in um, city center, thinking maybe here it's fine. No. They, one day, soldiers came to in our building. 
I could see them from the window up, up somewhere, and I don't know what floor we were living in. I could see a vehicle with soldiers and so many people looking for Tutsis. What did we do? Nothing. <laughs> we just looked different. <laughs> That's it. And they knocked at our door. They got, my wife opened the door. And the guy, the soldier, the, the chief, knew my wife. And said, oh, did I make a mistake or what? We're looking for an enemy who lives here. We need him. So I was just behind her. I said, oh, him. Okay. What can you do? This was my first time to see a gun, I mean, closer. I've never seen guns or touched any gun. That was my first time. I mean, these were big guns. Man, war guns. And then they, they took me. And the guy told my wife in front of me, said, the only thing I can guarantee you, we are now going to kill him today. You know, you can't imagine what goes through someone's mind when someone says, we are now going to kill you today. But what did I do? I don't know. So they took me. I'm going to skip so many things. That day, I found myself in prison. They just opened an office. They pushed me there. And then they pushed. I found other people there. Uh, we were all sitting on the ground. I was about to say, I don't want to sit on the ground, but I did not say that. I just sat on the ground, like, automatically. And in front of me was a young man. I suppose the person was Tusi as well. For any reason, I think, I don't know what he did. He must have, have opposed to something. He must have maybe asked the question. What are you doing? And something. But that was enough to kill him right away. So that person, that young man, maybe 16, 17, they killed him in front of me. I, I could touch him. Just right there. Soldiers came and started jumping on his chest. That's how they killed him. They jumped. They broke everything. They killed him. Imagine now a person like me, who is non-violent, I don't watch horror movies, I mean, I don't like to see even blood. Five minutes ago, I was just in the comfort of my house, maybe afraid because of things that were happening, and then five minutes later, we're talking about killing. Never seen anybody killed, never seen, I mean, no idea. What a shock. Just right there. And they came, they took me, they said, oh, we are going to the judge. And then I saw a guy, he said, oh, he was a judge. And um, they said, okay, we, the judge started asking me questions. Who are you? Where are you coming from? And I said, I explained, and I don't understand what I'm doing here. I was not the only one anyways. Many other people were there some relatives, so we knew pretty much each other. And the guy told me, okay, um, I cannot release you, but I'm going to keep you today here. And then I said, okay, what, what, why did you guys arrest me? He said, it is on the paper. So he gave me a paper. And on the paper, it was saying, questionable Future. So, mo doubtful morphology. So, how I look like is questionable. You don't look like people from here. You are an enemy. I have never heard something stupid like that. But that was enough to arrest me and kill me. I knew there was a military camp over there. Never been. But that time, I was in the prison, in the military camp, ready to be killed because of my facial features. 
And I was not the only one. So we spent, I spent a month in prison, and every single day they were killing up to 30 people. I know because I saw them. I know because they were coming and then take whoever they wanted. Amen. Ah, this is difficult. My wife did everything she could for them to release me. My wife is just a Congolese, 100%. Has nothing to do with Hutus and Tutsis and probably did not understand what is this thing. Who did I marry, my God? Who is this guy? So she, she was free to go everywhere she wanted. And her dad was a general in the army before he passed. So many soldiers and staff worked for her dad. So they knew her too. I don't know how she did, but she managed to get me out of there. Hallelujah. My wife did a lot for me. She played a big role. And she continues to play a big role until today. Amen. Sometimes we don't take the time to thank people enough. And she does not like that. She does not like the center stage. But she is always behind organizing and directing everything properly. During this time, uh, Apostle was away for uh, two years. She was the person behind every event, everything we did, every protocol, everything, the children ministry. She put order everywhere, everything in writing properly. Hallelujah. I know this is coming probably from her background. Not only <laughs> she was the only child of a general in the army, a very respected person, but she worked as an assistant for the a, a cell phone CEO company over there, and then for a, a information minister or budget minister. I don't know. Those high people. So her seriousness, her everything is coming from her background. This Friday, I was here. I'm sorry just to, to talk about you. I, don't, I know you don't like that. This Friday, I was off. I was here in the office. I was working. Uh, I went to the gym, and then I came here because it was quite a soggy. I need to get some, some stuff done. Around noon, she called me. She said, okay, uh, for Hezekiah mandate, we need someone to be here because the person who was supposed to be here was not available. Would you take the shift? I said, yes. And then she asked me, how, how are you dressed? I said, oh, gym uh, stuff. And I said, no. Because <laughs> for Hezekiah mandate, you have to dress properly. When you're there, you are a pastor. You cannot just go there in sneakers and stuff like that. So you have to come home, change, and go back to church to, because it becomes now um, office. Ah, I can't believe that. So I went home, I changed, and came back, and then I worked until 5, 6 p.m., and then went home. Seriousness in what she does. So I want to thank you for all of that. <laughs> Amen. During the time I got released from prison, I don't know how, we were praying crazy. When I was in prison, I knew already that God, God had said something that I will be released and I will come to North America. I knew that pretty much for the first days. My apartment building became a center of prayer. People were praying. I had some uh, pastor's friends who were coming every night to pray. But that is good. But on the other side, they were killing us. So they come, they say, you, you, and you, out. Sometimes other people will push you out because they pointed them. They point the person, that person stand up, grabs you, and throws you out. And then you are gone. Some other times, they will kill people. 
at the camp. It's a huge camp. And then they burn them. They come to get us to go bury them. Right there. Amen. It's just unbelievable. I'm going to just skip all these things. Just to say, just two little things that happened. One day, I, I had enough. Enough. But I was praying. I was questioning myself, God, why am I going through this? But at the same time, I was ready to die. Because you're going to die anyways. So I was ready to die. They came, they opened our cell. And they said, everyone out. So we knew that that day, it, it was another day like in other days. This time they did not choose. They said, everyone out. When we got out, I was singing in my heart. I was praying in my heart. My mind was connected to the, um, the vision that God gave me. And the word of God. But the reality was showing me you, you dying like uh, maybe in a minute. So they came. They put some people here. Other people there. And then they, I heard that the people from this village, they were okay. They, they, want, they don't, they don't want to kill them that day. And then they said, oh, the people from this village go there. I went there. I was not from that village. I was born in a city. I don't know nothing about those villages. So I started asking a guy called Meme. I asked him, so you from this village? He said, yeah, yeah. Okay, just give me a name of a village, a name of a place. So he will give me the name, and two seconds after, I don't remember. I said, okay, what did you say again? In the middle of that, they had already killed four people. With a, with a knife just in front of us. And the guy, the chief commander, sent someone to look for me. I had a particular shirt with the president picture on it, <laughs> crying that that will help. Did not have much. I said, oh, that guy with Kabila's picture, no, he come here. That was me. And... All of a sudden, he started speaking to me in one of the, language, the languages uh, that I happened to, to know a little bit. Because he was confused in his mind if I was from that tribe or the enemy's tribe. And that tribe was his tribe. He said, hi. I responded, hi. How are you doing? I said, very, very good, I can say, and stuff like that. In his own language. Congo is a huge country with more than 200 different languages, cultures, everything you can imagine. And he got confused. He said, okay, clean your hands and go there and eat. I cleaned my hands and I went and I started eating somewhere there. And here they were killing and soldiers were coming. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And at some point, that day, so I was not killed, but some of the, the people I know, they were killed just right there. And then they put me in one of the cells. I, I changed. They gave me another cell where um, we, it was a mix of enemies and uh, the people who were just uh, in prison. I don't know what happened, but I found myself there. And one night, and that cell was very good because I could see outside, I could see my wife coming, bringing me food uh, because they don't give you food in the prison. And then I could see soldiers taking the food she brought for me. The soldiers will eat that food. I could see all of that. But at least I was able to see outside. Amen? One night, around midnight, I heard outside of my cell, which was uh, closer to the, the big main entrance with a big uh, a door, a huge. 
the, the, the guy who was in charge of the prison was arguing with people who were sent from the, the president's guard, whatever they call them. Say, we heard that in this cell here, that was mine, there are enemies hiding in there. We need them. It was just easy to open the door and anybody will say, it's you, 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 and you. <laughs> it, it was very easy. But that guy who was in charge of the security that night said, um, I know you coming from the presidency, but I received clear orders that at night, I'm now going to open this cell here. So no one will go out. He says, okay, do you know where we're coming from? The person said, I know, but I'm not going to open anything and no one will go out. Unless my boss tells me to open. And the soldier said, okay, call your boss. They had this uh, walkie, talkie, whatever. And then he started calling the boss. Commander, commander, over. Commander, commander, over. The commander never responded. He called like for 30 minutes. It was 1 a.m. Everyone was sleeping, including the commander. So because they could not reach the guy to give the order to open the cell, that night, no one was killed. Amen. And all the following nights until my wife managed to get me out. And for eight months, I was now living in um, hiding in an apartment building. And many other things happened that I cannot go through. Until one, da one day, we got a word from God that that's the day I had to leave the country and go. It was easy to leave the country when you are now a person in my situation. Because if I take a, a boat, it will take me five minutes to get to a nearby country, actually a, near, a nearby um, uh, capital city. This is another country. It's just five minutes uh, apart. But at that place where we were taking the boat, that's the place they killed most people. And that's the place God convinced us to go through. Leaving my apartment building alone was a problem. Now going to take this boat with all these people who were there looking for enemies was crazy. But that's the day I said, okay, I listened to what God is saying, let's go. Brothers and sisters, prayers work. We prayed for God to close our enemy's eyes. We saw that in action. I went down the apartment building, entered in the vehicle of one of the guys. We drove to, to, the, to, the, to the, the border to take this boat to go on the other side. It was full of people that I know. That was my neighborhood. But every time I fix a person, I see the person becomes distracted, looks down or talks with another person. The eyes were closed. We got to the end of where the vehicle could go, as far as the vehicle could go. At, at the, they call it the beach. That's where you take the boat to cross to the other country. It was full of soldiers. One soldier came and stopped us. Uh, I said, okay, maybe this is the end. He came, he looked into the vehicle. I was sitting at the, the back. I had my suit on. He looked at me. And instead of opening the door and throwing me out, he saluted me. <laughs> I was very confused. 
I did not know what to do. I, 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 I did this. Because I was very cold. That's not what I was expecting. He went in front of the vehicle. He said, there is a VIP person here. Open the way. So he was, oh man. He was now in front of the vehicle, opening the way. It was full of soldiers and full of people. We went to the parking lot to the end of everything. And then from there, uh, our friends went to look for papers and stuff because you cannot just leave the country like that. Everything went smooth. But the boat, when we were done, the boat had already left. I know it's five minutes, but I could see the boat leaving us. Oh, my God. And the soldier took his walkie-talkie, whatever it is, and called the boat back. He said, we need our boat back here. There is a VIP person here. Unbelievably, that huge thing came back again. The soldier, the soldiers, because there were many, obeying to the command of that guy, I don't know him, never seen him before, they went in the boat, they opened the VIP uh, cabin, there were people in there, they threw them out, they came to get me, I said, okay, chief, this is your place. I don't understand, but it happened. That's how I left the country, like a king. Like a king. I'm going to just skip everything because it's not necessary right now. Amen. Any person who went through traumatizing situations, persecution like the one I went through, or any kind of abuse, let me tell you, it's very traumatizing. You live out of there really wounded. Those events will change the way you talk, the way you think, the way you act, the way you see people, the way you see yourself, even the way you see God. Because you don't understand why you went through all these things. And before you know, if you don't pay attention, bitterness, resentment grow in you. But how do you get from the event, a traumatizing event, to a spirit of revenge and bitterness? How do you get there? Very slowly. Because the enemy starts talking to you. you. You know you're nothing. You are about to be killed. You know you are from the, the wrong tribe. That little voice will belittle you, will diminish you, will remind you about your past experiences. But I'm here just to tell you what I did. For me, it was simple. I made a very clear choice. I chose God. I chose to rely fully and completely on God. At that time, God reminded me something very profound. God reminded me that my biggest enemy was not Satan. It was me, myself. God reminded me that Jesus defeated Satan already. Hallelujah. Which means Satan had absolutely no power to make me sin. But Satan had the power to influence my mind, to influence what I think until I start thinking like him and finally do what he wanted me to do in the first place. Making myself responsible of my own actions against me. Hallelujah. You understand that living in a situation like that 
confined in a very small place. Sometimes I was living in a drawer because people were looking for me still for those eight months I was living in hiding. When I got free, I will just skip how and how I got to the city of Montreal, Canada. When I got there, I realized that I could not walk. All that I could do was just to walk um, like around like this. That's it. Because for closer to a year, I did not really walk. Every time I tried to catch the bus, I was not able to get to the bus. And that's the time the devil started uh, telling me, you will not be able to walk. You will not walk again. Brothers and sisters, Christians, we go through challenges. But how you handle them will determine if you will succeed or not. Every time I was unable to walk, I said to myself, I will walk and I will even run in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Today, I walk, I jump, I run. Amen? If you don't believe me, you can challenge me. Anybody except Brother Douglas can challenge me. I will walk faster than you and I will run faster than you. Jumping, I'm not sure. But those two, I am able to. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But more seriously, the devil started convincing me that God was unfair. This situation is unfair. The devil started convincing me that God did not love me. I'm pretty sure it happened to you. You lost a loved one. You lost something precious. You lost something you worked on very hard. And then the devil tells you, God does not love you. Brothers and sisters, I relied on the word of God. This is what Romans 8.38 says in the Passion Translation. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I am convinced that his love will triumph over death, over life's troubles, over fallen angels, and over dark rulers in the heavens. Hallelujah. There is nothing in our present and even in our future circumstances that can weaken God's love for us. There is absolutely nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever, ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passion love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. The devil tried to tell me that God did not love me. It did not work because I relied on the word of God. Hallelujah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 7 to 9, in the Amplified Bible says, Instead of your former shame, you shall have a twofold recompense. Instead of a dishonor, reproach, you shall rejoice in the portions of your enemies. Therefore, in your enemies' land, in front of them, you shall possess double what they have taken away from you. You shall possess everlasting joy. Hallelujah. Just right there in front of them. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong with violence. I hate them all. And I will faithfully give them, give you your recompense. Hallelujah. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Hallelujah. I chose to follow God without any hesitation and without any condition. And God rewarded me double portion. 
double portion. Everything that I, have lo I had lost, God restored them beyond expectations. Brothers and sisters, the Bible does not say, I will reward you double once you die. You know, in heaven, I will have a mansion for you, a beautiful one. No. The Bible says, here, in front of your enemy. That's where I will bless you. Hallelujah. If you did not hear my story, if you did not know me, you wouldn't know I was persecuted this way. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that during that time until today, it has been 20 years in some, I never took any pill for anxiety. I never spent a dime for counseling sessions. I never had even a tiny little small one second nightmare, ever. Hallelujah. All that I did was every day to confess with my mouth that I'm the child of the most high God. And that no weapon formed against me shall ever prosper. Hallelujah. I repeat it because living eight months in a situation you don't know if they will come to get you back and this time kill you, it's very difficult. Hallelujah. So I repeat it that if God was for me, who can dare be against me? Hallelujah. I pray to God. I meditated his word on a daily basis many times. And every time I was sick, even when I was in prison, I prayed over my sickness. I remember I had a very terrible back issue. No way to get a medicine from outside. Smuggled in. Impossible. So I prayed from his stripes. I am healed. And I got healed to the point I realized a few days after that I did not have any back issue. I did not remember where this back issue went. I had no clue. Brothers and sisters, when the Spirit of God comes to comfort you, to give you peace, everything that does not belong to God will just disappear. Hallelujah. And then once we moved to Calgary, I surrendered myself with people that I knew. They feared God and they loved God. Do you have my picture, brother? Amen. These are the people I surrendered me with. And many others are not on this picture. I know we were 12 and 13 at that time. <laughs> Glory to God. Here was on September 2nd, uh, 2002, in the Banff or Kananaskis area, praying with Apostle. Those are the people I surrounded myself with to keep me in the Word of God. If you do not do that, you are going to lose your mind. Hallelujah. Thank you for the picture. Brothers and sisters, regardless of what you can think and imagine, you're going to get to the conclusion that life is not fair. I did not do anything wrong, absolutely wrong, nothing. All my relatives and the people I know who were killed did not do anything wrong. They just belonged to the wrong tribe or they had a doubtful morphology or whatever they will call it. That's all they did. Some people will try to convince you that God is not fair. Ah, take a minute and think about it. If God was fair, if God had to give you everything that you deserve, uh, let's be fair, let's be normal here. If God had to be that fair in the definition of fair, all of us would spend eternity in hell. Am I right? Am I right? Hallelujah. 
The Bible says God is just. Our God is a God of justice. And justice means that our God will make the wrong thing right. It was wrong, but God will turn the wrong thing into something that is right. But we need to trust him. And we need to handle the wrong thing right. That's the reason I do not hate the people who did what they did ever. I have no resentment. I, I have nothing in my heart because God took care of that. Hallelujah. If you want to overcome what you're going through, no revenge. Zero. Forgive those people who wronged you. If you do not do that, you're going nowhere. Hallelujah. My interest here is not me. My story is behind me. My interest is you. I believe that whatever happened to me was in God's plan. And honestly, I thank God because he took me through such persecution. I thank him. If he did not do that, I could not be the person that I am today. The book of Romans chapter 8 verse 28 in the New King James Version says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Hallelujah. No matter what happened to you, everything will work for good for you because you love God. Hallelujah. God will change the wrong thing that happened to you into something good. But it depends on how you handled the wrong thing. Did you handle them right? Hallelujah. I know many of us experienced terrible situations. Some of the people who are here lost parents, siblings. Some of the people who are here lost them through genocide and uh, so many other killings that happened th throughout where you're coming from. Some of us were abused since they were born. Hallelujah. All kinds of abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, physical, verbal, with terrible manifestations like neglect, humiliation, denigration, the yelling and calling uh, you names. You're here and you know what I'm talking about. What I want to say today is the effect of these abuse, these things I went through, will manifest, will go really far into your adulthood. You may survive, you are a child, it's okay. You grow up, you go to school. 25 years down the road, it comes to bug you. Hallelujah. Some of us here are just hopeless. I know what I'm talking about. Hopeless. They went through things they cannot even talk about. You get to the point where you do not know where to go, who to go to, who to trust, who can help you. You have no idea. Some of us or some of the people we see and we know, they get to the point where they are on their own. And that's the time they think about killing themselves. Because they have no hope. They have nobody who can understand them and help them. But let me tell you, Today, you are not alone. Hallelujah. If you went through any kind of abuse, persecution from a husband, from parents, child molestation, child abuse, you are not alone. It got to the point where throughout the time I spent with these killers trying to kill me in the morning or at any time, I thought I was alone. Because all the people that were around me were the people who either you are on the list to be killed or you are a killer. So I thought at some point I was alone. But I was Christian, born again at that time. But I made the choice to focus everything on God. 
And I understood that I was not alone. Brothers and sisters, let me repeat. You are not alone. Hallelujah. You are not. I can say with confidence, any person, anybody who experienced traumatizing event experiences like I went through can fully recover. God can restore you fully and completely. God can heal you. Hallelujah. Oh, brothers and sisters, there is no situation that is too difficult for our God. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing is challenging for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm asking you to trust God. Hallelujah. Probably don't trust me, but trust God. Because I trusted God, and I saw his hand moving in my life. For all of us who were abused, persecuted, some of you were unwanted. You were even told by your parents you were unwanted. Hallelujah. Let me just remind you that the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross was to give us life beyond neglect, beyond abuse, beyond genocide, beyond all kinds of persecutions. Hallelujah. To give you life now and forever. Hallelujah. When God gives you life, it's not always you die. No, no, no. To give you li life now and forever. The purpose of Jesus dying, dying on the cross was not for you to be stuck in a problem you are in forever. No, it was to give you life. Hallelujah. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross helped me to be free and to move on with my life like nothing has happened. Hallelujah. Oh, I, know, I don't know if it's the temperature or what. I am saying... Jesus sacrificed on the cross, hallelujah, helped me to be free and helped me to move on with my life. Hallelujah. May Jesus work on the cross, free you as well. Hallelujah. Free you from the horror of genocide in Rwanda and in the other countries. Hallelujah. May that sacrifice Free you from the neglect from your parents, abuse from relatives. Hallelujah. Free you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of us here were told you are not good enough. You are useless. I gave you examples back then. Some of you were told they were unqualified, unwanted. Hallelujah. When you let those lies get into your mind... Later on, they will define you. Hallelujah. Let me say, Jesus went to the cross for you too. For you too. So, today I'm asking you to let go of your past. Let it go. Let your past go. Stop the blaming game. I am not excusing people who wronged you. No. That's not my problem. It's God's problem. By you, you have to let those things go if you want to live. Hallelujah. Let them go and embrace your new life. A life that is filled with God's love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you hold on God's word today, if you take that firm decision to hold on God's word, I pray and I declare that God will give you beauty for those ashes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you truly understand me and take some decision about your life, I pray and declare that you will step in your future. That's all I did. I grabbed God's word. Hold tight. Even though on this side they wanted to kill me. And today, I am able to say, I was able to say, I am stepping in my future. In my life, you haven't seen nothing yet. More is coming, hallelujah, just because I relied on God. 
Hallelujah. I would like to finish by saying some of us pretend that they are okay. Hallelujah. Some of us pretend that you don't need any help. Even though you get crazy when a child does a tiny little thing in your house. And you don't know where this anger is coming from. Just a simple little things, you lose your mind and you pretend you are okay. That behavior is not normal. Hallelujah. So do not pretend you are okay. You're not. Amen. Some of us always blame the spouse. For everything that is happening to you, you blame your spouse. Some of us, some parents here, they call their kids names. They insult them. They yell when the children are not doing exactly what they wanted when they wanted it. Hallelujah. Do not pretend that that's okay. That's not okay. That's not an okay behavior. Hallelujah. I know many people who are still addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs. Why? Because an uncle abused you 20 years ago. Hallelujah. Today, for you, the risk is for yourself to kill yourself or to harm other people around you is really, really, really high because of events that happened in your life, even when you were a small baby. Hallelujah. Because you, they messed up you emotionally and physically and verbally. It's harming you. It's following you everywhere you go. And you think you're okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm married. I have, no, I'm, I'm okay. When a tiny little thing happens, it affects you badly. When another man says hi to your wife, my goodness, World War III. The demons of insecurity and jealousy, they make you crazy. You want to fight everyone. You can't sleep. You can't even think right. You can't get over it. Hallelujah. You hold um, resentment. You can't forgive anybody. From some of us, it's known in your family that you have a bad temper. You are a good guy. You do everything right. But my goodness, you have a bad temper. At work, you are too controlling. The people who work with you are miserable. They cannot take it anymore. Nobody can have a good idea except yourself. You manipulate people around you just to get to what you're looking for. You prefer to have people pleaser around you. Hallelujah. And you pretend you are okay. You are not okay. Because that behavior is not okay. Hallelujah. That behavior is just there to feed the demons of insecurity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're always right. It's only you who is right. Everyone else, no. Hallelujah. Everyone who resists you, you eliminate them from your friendship. You eliminate them uh, at work. You don't want to see them. Brothers and sisters, we cannot go back and change what happened to you 20 years ago. There is no way I can go back and change what happened to me 20 years ago. Because I have a solution. Amen. What happened in our past life, like Apostle said last Sunday, is what is causing us to behave the way we behave. But today we can decide that that abuse that has been passed down from a great-grandparent to a grandparent to your dad and to yourself, you can decide today it stops here with me. Today. Today you can decide that or the effect of abuse that you have been suffering from years and years. Stop here right now. That's a decision that you can take. The enemy intended to hurt you, to destroy you, to mess you up, to mess your future up. I declare that God, our faithful God, will turn that into something good for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Can I hear you, God?
people of God. God will turn that into something good. We can now go back and change what happened, but God will use all of that into something good for you. I say this seriously. What will set you free? It's not a painkiller every morning. It's the word of God. There is nothing wrong about painkillers. You can take as much as you want. Hallelujah. But it's only the word of God that helped me to be free. Some times ago, I preached about a crippled person at the pool who was looking to be released from, to be healed. For 38 years, he was coming to the same pool where every single year there will be a time where people will be healed. But ever him, and Jesus decided to go there. When he saw the guy, he did not heal him instantly. He asked him, do you want to get well? How come do you want to get well? Yeah, for sure, for 38 years I've been coming here. Brothers and sisters, the problem is we become comfortable with what we have that is wrong. We become very comfortable. Hallelujah. And even when we pray, we pray for God to accommodate us in something that is wrong with us. Instead of praying for God to heal us completely. Hallelujah. So let me say this. Today, this morning, wherever your wife betrayed you, wherever your husband or your boss at work abused you, do not run out of the house. Do not resign from work. Do not withdraw from the society. Hibernate into, with your issues somewhere. Do not do that. Hallelujah. If you want to run, run to God. Hallelujah. This morning, I'm closing. God is saying in Revelation 3.20, I am the door and I'm, I am at the door and I'm knocking. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. Brothers and sisters, this word is for you. God knocked at my door and I opened. And that's how I got free. Like this crippled person at the pool, you have the responsibility of opening the door and inviting God. If you do not do that, for 38 years, you will be going to the same pool where other people have been healed, but not you. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Peter, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. If you would like to stand up, as I'm fin I, I finish. Hallelujah. I know it's not easy to turn the page. Personally, I had to let go my past. Truly and sincerely, I had to forgive those who hurt me. In order for me to be the person that I am today. There is no other secret. If you let go of your past failures, mistakes, hurts, if you trust God and forgive those who hurt you, who wronged you, this morning in this place, I pray and declare that the chains of abuse and hurt that are being broken right now in this place. What is your choice? You choose to believe God you choose to forgive other people. Those chains that are still linking you to the problem that you had 20 years ago are broken. Broken in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I hear the sound of chains being broken. I hear the chains of abuse being broken. I hear the chain of horror of genocide being broken in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I declare that today is a new day for you. Hallelujah. I declare that here this morning, God will pay you double, a double portion. Hallelujah. Let me declare this morning that favor will surround you. Hallelujah. You will have a new life, a new experience. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, if you believe what I have been preaching today, 
if you tap into God's word, I declare that you'll step up to the woman and man that God has created you to be in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.